why we are debating this, uh, this bill, because uh, this bill is uh, a bill that is uh, unconstitutional in almost every clause that uh, have gone through, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, secondly, um, in the tradition of bicameral parliament, bicameralism is uh, managed through non-legislative. Uh, it's managed uh, outside uh, the, the law. Uh, I mean, uh, without uh, specific legislation. It is the norms, it is the tradition, and it's a standing order. So for one to decide to come up with a, a piece of legislation to manage the relationship between the two houses, I think in itself, it is a, a new standard that uh, the owner of this bill is trying to come up with. Mr. Speaker, I know uh, probably one of the reasons why uh, the owner of this bill is trying to come up with this bill is because of uh, the power struggles that uh, the two houses have had in the past. Mr. Speaker, you remember the petition number 284 of 2019, which led to the High Court nullifying a record 23 pieces of legislation, including the Tax Laws uh, Amendments Act, which uh, the court declared them a nullity. And um, I think uh, when you read through this bill, you see an attempt to try and um, patch up things so that we do not have a, an, an opportunity of going to court when we feel that uh, there has uh, been uh, some form of discrimination or uh, unfairness on the part of the uh, Senate. So this bill, basically, I look at it from that uh, prism, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are in bicameral parliament. But maybe we need to reflect as a house whether uh, truly we are in a bicameral uh, uh, parliament or we are just something uh, in between there. Because bicameralism has to have an upper house. If you look at other jurisdictions, UK, US, France, even here in Africa, uh, a country like uh, Nigeria in West Africa, Bicameralism must have a house that is reasonable, a house that is small, a house that looks at issues uh, with expert scrutiny, a house that uh, provides further democratic check on the lower house. That is bicameralism. But now, in this country, we basically have two houses. One house that pretends to be an upper house, which is supposed to be a lower house. I think we must have a relook at uh, the way uh, bicameralism is structured in this country. Mr. Speaker, I had an opportunity uh, last year to visit uh, uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, where I visited the House of Representatives and I also visited the Senate. And uh, when you visit the two houses in that country, even before someone tells you that this is a lower house and this is an upper house, you see for yourself, you see for yourself how the Senate of uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria is strong and effective and uh, you remember that is the house. Recently, they rejected the presidential uh, request to send the military to Niger and uh, other countries which had uh, problems. The house acts with some firmness. 
the House cannot be intimidated. I think the same should happen in, in Kenya. And I want to thank uh, Senate. We have really tried. In the eyes of the public, we have come out as a more reasonable house, a, a, a house that stands with the people, a house that is um, effective. Unlike our colleagues on the other house where I served for five years, which have become a disgrace to this society. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it was a shame the way the National Assembly managed the impeachment motion against uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary Linturi. And, and I think that should be a wake-up call to Kenyans that we really need Senate to veto the decisions of uh, National Assembly. Because at this rate, we are not going to have a parliament in this country. I was so disappointed, Mr. Speaker, that uh, when the finance bill 2023 was passed by that house, the members of parliament, the uh, National Assembly were cheering like school children to pass a, a, a bill that was going to punish the people of Kenya. And then a few months later, uh, an MP stands somewhere and says, we passed that bill without reading. That is a reason enough for that house to be vetted, to be vetoed by this Senate. And I think uh, someone here, I think is uh, Senator Sifuna, suggested that why can't the Senate also initiate bills to try and uh, uh, correct uh, these wrongs uh, in, in our parliamentary system so that we get things to be done in the right manner. Mr. Speaker, in bicameralism, if you look at the history of bicameralism, the Senate, in our case, is a house of calm, is a house that has experts, is a house that takes time to scrutinize matters before they pass. And I think that if this person who came up with this bill really meant well for this country, he should uh, have uh, looked at other jurisdictions where we have bicameralism and uh, understand that our problem is not how we relate with the National Assembly. Our problem is uh, that lack of clarity as to which house is uh, higher than the other. We, we say we are at the higher house because that is a global uh, uh, best practice. But legally, Mr. Speaker, I think we need to put it in our laws so that it's very clear that which house is bigger than the other. Mr. Speaker, if you read through this uh, bill, you notice that the intention is basically to cripple the Senate and make Senate weak and weak and weak. I have uh, gone through the provisions of this bill, Mr. Speaker, and if you look at clause seven, you list, it is listing a number of uh, laws and uh, uh, basically trying to say that uh, this particular bill uh, should um, be the, the powers of the other house. For example, Mr. Speaker, when under C, they say the annual county allocation of revenue bill, uh, that it will be considered by both houses. But they go ahead and deny us the powers to participate in appropriations bill. Mr. Speaker, the constitution is very clear that uh, the Houses of Parliament should be involved in budget-making process. Why should we be, dis be, be denied an opportunity to participate in appropriations bill, a finance bill? Because after all, Mr. Speaker, we passed two major instruments in the finan fin financial process. The budget policy statement, which this House passes, 
the medium-term debt management strategy. Why are we involved in passing these two important financial instruments when we cannot be involved in participating in appropriations bill, in finance bill, or any other bill that is a money bill? Mr. Speaker, this is a bigger question that we want uh, answered. Mr. Speaker, this bill also tries to, uh, under clause number 14, where it says, if one house passes an ordinary bill concerning county government and the second house rejects the bill, it shall be referred for mediation committee. Mr. Speaker, on one hand, they want to make sure that Senate does not handle some bills. On the other hand, they want to curtail the Senate so that if Senate passes any bill that concerns counties, then they can veto it and take it to the mediation committee. That is mischief, Mr. Speaker, which I have noted there. Mr. Speaker, also, when you say that this bill affects counties and the other bill does not affect counties, it doesn't make sense at all. Because we are in the same county, country, and there is no bill that you can say this bill does not affect counties or this bill affects counties. All bills are the same. They affect counties in one way or another because we are in the same country, Mr. Speaker. So one wanting to legislate to make a decision as to which bill affects counties and which bill does not affect counties should not apply uh, here, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I also find uh, uh, section 17 of this bill uh, very, very unconstitutional because section 17.2 says that at any joint sitting of the House, the standing orders of the National Assembly shall apply. So what do we do with our standing orders in the Senate? they are basically invalidating the standing orders of the Senate. That the standing orders of Senate are inferior to the standing orders of the National Assembly. Mr. Speaker, it goes further to say that the speakers of the House of Parliament shall enforce any directions given during a joint sitting in relation to the conduct of a member of Parliament in accordance with the applicable provisions of the National Assembly standing orders. Mr. Speaker, this, what this implies is that uh, the, it elevates the Speaker of the National Assembly to someone even above our own Speaker, that this Speaker of the National Assembly will have the powers to punish a member of the Senate on a matter that has come up before the Joint Committee. So this is unconstitutional, and Mr. Speaker, uh, this should not see the light of the day. Mr. Speaker, public participation. In fact, now, this bill now goes beyond uh, the, 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 the main objective, which is uh, managing by Camerulism. It goes beyond that to introduce uh, uh, public participation, trying to put roadblocks on the public participation. Mr. Speaker, if you read section uh, 19, 19, section 19.3, where it says, a committee of a House of Parliament shall have broad measure of discretion in conducting public participation. What is that, Mr. Speaker? The courts have already ruled on this matter, Mr. Speaker, that public participation should not be cosmetic. Public participation should be done adequately. But this particular section is introducing um, this clause, so that they can, uh, those who like rushing bills through, 
can be able to rush through bills without adequate public participation. And then it goes ahead and talks about hides behind uh, duplication to deny the second house an opportunity to conduct adequate participation on a bill. Mr. Speaker, on the clause, on clause 19, 8, 7, 7 and 8, on the validity of uh, the bills which are processed by these houses. Again, this section is unconstitutional. Mr. Speaker, it says, a committee of parliament shall consider the views received from public participation broadly. Meaning that the, the, the specific views received from the public will not be given adequate attention. And this law will facilitate that, Mr. Speaker. And the aid says an act of parliament is not invalid, is not invalid on account of failure to incorporate any views submitted during public participation. You have seen, Mr. Speaker, the National Assembly. They go to the public, 90% of the views that are given by the public, they are never implemented in the final bill that is passed. One case is the finance bill, Mr. Speaker. Housing bill. All the things that the public said, they were never, never factored in the final bill that was passed by those houses. So basically, what this is trying to do, Mr. Speaker, is now introducing other provisions using bicameralism to make it easy for the other house to be passing bills without being questioned in court of law as to the adequacy of those bills in terms of public participation. Mr. Speaker, if you look at uh, section 20 of the bill that says, before formally declaring the existence of a dispute between the uh, Houses of Parliament, the House of Parliament shall in good faith make every reasonable effort and take all the necessary steps to amicably resolve the matter by initiating direct negotiations with each other or through an intermediary. Mr. Speaker, this is basically stopping either house from taking any other measures like going to court on a matter so that uh, we are not able to take our disputes to court when we are required to go to court as it has been done in the past. So, Mr. Speaker, generally, bill is unconstitutional. This bill goes against the tenets of bicameralism that is not known globally, and this bill should not even be passed by this House at this stage, the second reading. This bill should be rejected in totality, and uh, this bill is another attempt at uh, uh, killing devolution in this country. And we know that the House that has been persistently been used to kill devolution is the National Assembly. Everything they do, even the way they behave on the ground, Mr. Speaker, management of roads, rural roads in our counties, the National Assembly is an existential threat to devolution in this country. And we thought that now that we have a speaker who has been a senator, things will be different. Mr. Speaker, I am concerned that, in fact, under Speaker Wetangula, the National Assembly has become a very serious threat to devolution. I served in the National Assembly under uh, the current Attorney General, who was against devolution, but not to the extent of uh, the current speaker. He has basically, basically uh, demonstrated that he cannot... Senator Osotsi, your time is up.